So this person means the dancing Serbian lady. So let's talk about the dancing Serbian lady. A few years ago, this myth arose on the internet. There's a lady in Serbia that dances on the streets and if you get close to her, she will threaten you. She'll usually take out a knife and threaten you and chase you down. A lot of these claims were brushed under the rug because nobody really had proof until recently. They actually have a video of the dancing Serbian lady on the news in Serbia. At the end of the video, it is a little creepy too because she's walking towards the camera. If you're in Serbia and you see this lady on the street, do not get near her. It might just be your last day on earth. Let me know what you guys think about this in the comment section below. And if you're from Serbia, let me know if you've heard about this legend before. I have an update on the serial killer who is on the loose right now in California. If you missed my previous videos, essentially there's a serial killer who is on the loose right now in Stockton, California. Currently, he has been confirmed to take the lives of six people, but it's believed that he's actually linked to a couple of other murders. Most recently though, the Stockton killer actually attempted to kill somebody, but they got away. Her name was Natasha Latour and she lived in a tent in Stockton, California. The 46 year old says she was asleep in her tent when she was awoken to the sound of gravel crunching around her tent. She then walked out of her tent where she was greeted by the Stockton killer wearing all black and a black mask holding a gun pointing at her. Natasha then had a fight or flight response where she sprinted towards the killer to try to rush him. On her way towards the killer, the killer would duck down and shoot her nine to ten times. A train then began to pass by and Natasha actually found a way to escape. She was trudging along the streets of Stockton where she eventually collapsed in the middle of the road. Thankfully though, a couple came by and were able to take her to a hospital. She then recovered from her wounds, but unfortunately, she didn't have much information about the killer or his face. Can't really blame her, obviously, there's a lot of adrenaline in a moment like that. But I can't help but feel like we're getting closer to finding out who this killer is. And look, as I find more information, I'll make sure to let you guys know, but... Creepy facts about your body you're gonna wish you didn't know. When you go down a drop on a roller coaster and you suddenly feel your stomach drop, it's not just you feeling nervous. What you're feeling are your organs actually moving. Have you ever noticed that an older person in your life seems to have very long, large ears? That's because your ears will never stop growing. Across your lifetime, you will spend an average of an entire year just sitting on a toilet. When we see brains outside of the human body, they usually look pretty solid. But your brain, while inside your skull while you're alive, is actually very soft. It's like melted butter soft. This is why you should be scared of that one person you're talking to online that you're about to meet in real life. Blanca Arellano, a 51-year-old Mexican woman, was looking for love. She met a Peruvian man named Juan Villafuerte on an online gaming app. And on the last day of October, she traveled 3,000 miles to Lima, Peru to meet him. She thought that he could be the one. On November 7th, while in the beach city of Huacho, where Villafuerte lived, Blanca spoke to her niece on the phone and told her that the relationship was going well and that she was in love. Then then she went silent. Her niece suspected something was wrong after not being able to get into contact with her. She called for help on Twitter and reached out to Juan Villafuerte, who said that Blanca got bored of him and left to find a plane ticket back to Mexico, as he could not provide the life she wanted. But the truth was much, much darker. On November 10th, Peruvian authorities found a severed finger on the beach of Huacho. Then in the following days, they found a faceless head and then an arm and then a torso with no organs inside of it. They eventually identified Blanca Arellano via her family by the ring on her finger. Juan Villafuerte was arrested on charges of human organs trafficking. Authorities found traces of blood all over his apartment, and he reportedly posted TikTok videos of human organs days after Blanca's disappearance. Guys, check out this tweet. I shaved my dog's head and now I'm afraid of it. I wanted to leave my house, but it won't stop following me around. Look at this thing. I don't blame you. I'd be scared too. This dog only gets worse.
I think this is the scariest one by far. I would shit myself if I saw this, and I would not want to wake up to this thing staring at me. This is Carla Nash. She literally had her face ripped off by Travis the Chimp. People noticed that Travis the Chimp became way more irritable after they took him off his medication for his Lyme disease. But nobody expected when Carla picked up his Tickle Me Elmo toy for him to rip her face off and dismember her body. There is a 911 audio call between Sandra Harold and a dispatcher and her begging them to come out and kill the monkey because he's dismembering her friend. Carla had to undergo 72 hours of surgery and an experimental face transplant surgery. This left her completely blind for life. When police arrived on the scene, one of them shot Travis the chimp and then he died later right next to his cage. But the damage was already done. Carla was already disfigured and nearly dead. In my next video, I'm going to be playing audio clips from the 911 call between Sandra and the dispatcher. Stay tuned for that. cannibal facts that'll eat at you for days. If you thought Jeffrey Dahmer was picky for not eating people with tattoos, Venezuelan serial killer Dorangel Vargas, who ate 10 people, didn't like his victims to be overweight because he thought that they contained too much cholesterol. On Thanksgiving Day 1991, 23-year-old Omaima Nelson stabbed her sugar daddy William before carving him up and cooking his head in a deep fryer and eating him for dinner. In the 1970s, Jorge Negromonte, also known as the Brazilian Sweeney Todd, would bake his victims into pies before selling them to local townsfolk. After murdering and eating his classmate in 1981, Issei Sagawa was released from prison because of a loophole in Japanese law. Since then, he's actually profited off the crime, writing books, appearing on talk shows, and starring in adult films where he bites his fellow co-stars. In 2001, a man named Armin Maiwis posted an ad on a website called Cannibal Cafe looking for someone to be killed and eaten. A German engineer named Bern Brandis volunteered, and after photos and videos of the incident were posted online, Armin was sent to jail, where today, he's a vegetarian. In 1904, a Swedish sailor named Carl Pedersen shipwrecked on an island inhabited by cannibals. He was captured and taken to a local king whose daughter actually fell in love with him. The two then got married, had nine kids, and Carl became the new king. We talk all the time about people who have disappeared, but we don't often talk about celebrities that have disappeared. We're looking at three celebrities who vanished under very mysterious circumstances. NBA star Bison Daly. In 2002, Bison, his girlfriend, his brother, and the captain all set sail on a private boat from Tahiti and did not come back. Weeks later, the boat does dock with just the brother inside and bullet holes patched up. We've never been able to prove this, but the FBI believes the brother was involved and disposed of the bodies overboard. Joe Pitchler. He was the star of a couple of the Beethoven movies in the early 2000s, but at the age of 18, he completely vanished in 2006 after leaving a note that said he wished he could have been a stronger brother. Though they suspect he ended things himself, his remains have never been found. Patrick Dermott. Patrick isn't exactly a celebrity per se. He was the boyfriend of Olivia Newton-John, who you would know as Sandy from Greece. In 2005, he vanished right off a sailboat. What was odd was all 20 passengers who last saw him all had conflicting testimony. Do you remember the story of the adult woman who was pretending to be a child in order to get adopted? Well, the story is so much crazier than that. In 2010, the Barnett family adopted Natalia Grace, a six-year-old girl from Ukraine. But shortly after the adoption, the family claimed that Natalia wasn't who she said she was. She couldn't speak any Ukrainian, which the family thought was weird, but she was also showing signs of being post-puberty, meaning she probably wasn't six years old. So the parents got a bone density test done on her, and the doctor said that she was at least 14, if not older. And on top of that, her behavior was starting to become menacing. She would stand over the parents' beds at night saying she was just waiting for the right time. And she threatened violence against the three other sons. One time she even tried to poison the mother. But what do the parents do? They get her age legally changed to 22 years old, rent her an apartment, and leave her in it by herself. They thought they were escaping a murderer, but many believe that they abandoned a disabled child. There's so many twists and turns to this story, and I do a whole deep dive on my podcast this week. Today's case is one of these cases that you'll most likely recognise, like, the famous mugshot from. So, this here is 18-year-old Shailene Moran. 
at the time of what she did, she was 18 years old, and this takes place in 2019. She was from a place called Pawtucket, which is in America, and in the fall of October 2019, she met a boy online who she started a relationship with. This boy was called Leonard Trowfield, and I couldn't find any photos of him for some reason. On the first day that they met in person, the pair stayed at Leonard's house. However, after day four, the pair got into quite the argument where Shailen had stormed out of the house and filed a police report against Leonard. And she had called assault, which Leonard absolutely denied was not true. The pair were then given a no contact order. And the reason why I'm kind of leaning to believe Leonard is, I'll tell you why. So obviously when you're given a no contact order, you cannot contact that person. But this didn't bother Shailen. She was sending death threats to absolutely all of his family including his dog. So after the breakup, she then very quickly met Jack Doherty and together they had conspired that they were going to kill Shailen's ex. And Jack was absolutely down for that. He was so ready to do it. They were sending each other texts like, if you do this, we'll be together forever. I love you and all all that. And at the end of December 2019, so we're literally talking two months later, Jack came down from New York to see Shailen not only this, he also brought an engagement ring with him and the pair were ready to go to her ex's house to commit a shooting. So Shailen had actually stayed in a hotel nearby where the pair were staying. She didn't go with him and they decided that they were just going to shoot whoever opened the door. So on January 1st, 2020, Jack Doherty went to the address of Leonard and it was his mother, Cheryl Smith, that opened the door and she was shot several times which killed her. Another strange thing that I just want to know, I couldn't find many photos of Cheryl either, to which after it took place, they then posted this on Facebook, which says, we some fighters and some shooters. And she's also showing off her engagement ring in the poll. Luckily, a detective that was responding to the shooting had saw this post that these two had posted. So literally just a couple hours later, they were arrested in the hotel room, which I just think is kind of funny, to be honest. Like, how stupid do you have to be? And the cops found the gun that was used in the shooting that matched the bullets found in Cheryl. Jack Doherty is still in prison awaiting trial, but because Shailen was really the mastermind behind it, she 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 knew what she was doing. She was sentenced to life in prison for her part on killing Cheryl Smith. A man who disappeared almost a decade ago has been found newly deceased, but the mystery continues. In July 2013, Robert Hoagland disappeared from his Connecticut home. He was married with three sons and his family were extremely concerned when they discovered that he had not taken his phone, wallet or passport with him. He was last seen on July the 28th at a petrol station in Newtown. He'd filled his car with petrol and bought a map from the station. This was to be his final card purchase. He was captured smiling on CCTV and hours later, a neighbor saw him mowing the lawn. He'd actually planned with his wife to pick her up from the airport because she'd been on holiday. However, when he was due to arrive, he just never showed up. When she finally made her own way home, she discovered that he had not turned up for work either and his car was still on the drive. When police searched his computer, they discovered that all of his searches had been deleted. Now, Robert's son had been struggling with substance abuse and Robert had recently confronted some men associated with his son. This was in connection with two family laptops that had gone missing and Robert thought that these two men had stolen them. However, police looked into these men and found no evidence linking them to his disappearance. Police investigations continued to reach dead ends, but all of that changed on the 5th of December, 2022. Police were called to an address where a man was deceased. This man was Robert Hoagland. He'd been living under a new identity since 2013. He lived with his roommate, David, in Rock Hill, New York, and David believed his name to be Richard King. Robert had told David that he was newly divorced from his wife and wanted to start a new life. No cause of death has been released yet, but police are not suspecting foul play. I'm not trying to alarm anyone, but I think everyone living in Oregon should be aware of what's about to happen. This is Richard Gilmore, also known as the serial. He's been in prison since 1987 after being found guilty of sexually assaulting a 13-year-old girl. But he admitted to sexually assaulting nine other girls and women. 
Unfortunately, he wasn't tried for the other attacks because they fell just outside the statute of limitations. He got his nickname because he would case out his victims' homes in Portland, Oregon in the 70s and 80s while jogging, and he would return later to attack. Well, after having his sentence cut in half just one year after being convicted, Richard is about to be released from prison on December 16th of this year. He will be released into transitional housing in Multnomah County, but the most disgusting part is that once released, he will only be classified as a level one sex offender, which is considered at the lowest risk of reoffending. This is shocking to me because the last psychological evaluation that was done on him was done in 2016, and that evaluation deemed him dangerous to society stemming from a mental or emotional disorder predisposing him to crime. Once released from prison, he will be on supervision until 2034. But even though he'll have to register as a sex offender for the rest of his life, because he is classified as a level one offender, the state and county is not required to notify any of his neighbors that he is a sex offender. This is so scary as a parent that someone with this violent of a history could possibly move in next door with absolutely no warning. His victims are outraged that he isn't being classified as a higher level offender, especially considering that at the time of his trial, he was labeled a very dangerous offender. What's even scarier is that right now it's being reported that Richard could be required to have no contact with his victims. Could be? I'm sorry, but that is absolutely just not enough. I can't even imagine how they must be feeling right now. So if you live in Oregon, please be aware that this man will be released on December 16th. And please stay safe. A gruesome story leads off our newscast. Milwaukee police found body parts in a north side apartment and now they wonder if they've uncovered some kind of death factory. So our investigation is going to start here at the Ambassador Hotel in Milwaukee. At this famous room, room number 507. You can tell this room is famous because all of these actual, or because all these other rooms have actual markers. This room is just paper on the wall. If you'll step inside the room with me, this is a very, very important room in the story of Jeffrey Dahmer. Step in. It was right inside here, in this space, where Jeffrey Dahmer committed his first murder in Milwaukee. He invited a man named Stephen Tuomi, who he met at a bar, to come back with him, led him to this hotel, and proceeded to absolutely eviscerate him. Stephen was never found. It was here in this exact space where Jeffrey Dahmer brought Stephen back, he drugged him, he assaulted him, and then ultimately Jeffrey in the morning woke up and Stephen had been murdered. He was apparently laying next to him and Jeffrey had no idea what happened, as he would claim later on. It's definitely eerie in here. I don't, we don't know if the, this is where the bed has always been. This is the actual space where Jeffrey Dahmer murdered someone. It's the only accessible place. The other locations are houses, private residences, and his apartment complex is obviously gone, but this is the one place where you could come to actually connect and you can see it and feel it, you know? So this is the one murder that Jeffrey Dahmer claims he does not remember, but he picked Stephen up somewhere around Milwaukee and he brought him here. And then he said the next thing that he remembered was waking up, his hands were all bruised and bloody. And then Jeffrey kind of panicked, went and bought a suitcase and stuffed his body into the suitcase in this room. And yeah, then he took him to his grandma's house and dismembered him. It is really weird doing the show and everything because even just coming here, it's dark. And I just keep having these flashes of just imagining like Jeffrey Dahmer like beating somebody or like attacking somebody and I can't help but flash back in time to just see that, you know, because it happened right here in this space. It's hard to believe. But without further ado, let's uh, let's go to the investigation because we captured some very compelling stuff in here. And then we're off to more locations in the, uh, the Jeffrey Dahmer story and the story of the victims, more importantly. Jeffrey, I'm going to start this audio recorder. Oh, the moment that I did that. seen that happen. K2's got a solid reading too. Is this... 
Is this Jeffrey Dahmer? Could you light that up if this is Steven Tuomi? Do you know the name Jeffrey Dahmer? Can you tell me who you are? Do you know the name Jeffrey Dahmer? Is that a bad name? If this is Steven, can you tell me what happened that night? <laughs> There's definitely some energy in here. Oh. Major trigger warning, the story is extremely violent. Daniel Petrie was a very violent kid, so violent he had to be taken out of school. When taken out, he discovered a love for online games, TV, and all that type of stuff. When playing a game called Tibia, he met a little boy called Gabriel Kuhn. Daniel was 16 and Gabriel was 12 at the time. At some point, Gabriel asked Daniel to send him a bunch of money in this Tibia game that equaled almost $2 back then. He promised he would give it back, but as time showed, he didn't. They lived on the same street, so it was very easy for Daniel to access Gabriel, and he was frustrated and angry that he wouldn't give him the money back. One day, Daniel lost his temper and marched over to Gabriel's house. He found him alone with no parents and decided that he was going to essay him. The more Gabriel screamed of pain, the more power Daniel had over him. And in that moment, he decided he was gonna off him. He began by chopping his legs off, which during the autopsy, they found out that the boy was alive when his legs were being chopped off. 
and dismembered his entire body, threw him in a hallway, and left. Gabriel's older brother found his body and reported what had happened. And Daniel was only given three years of prison, and he is out today. Although no one has seen him or knows where he is.